Uh, let me start. And <coughs> uh, this is dynamic of labor immigration to the Russia Federation. And uh, you, uh, this slide shows a uh, situation with a uh, number of work permits and uh, patents of last year, uh, which have been uh, given for foreigners in the Russia Federation. And you can see dynamic of growth up of uh, till 2008 and uh, just uh, decline in 2009 after a financial crisis in the Russia and uh, growing up again after uh, 2009. And in 2010, Russia has a new system with patent for migrants who worked in uh, works in uh, uh, private household. I talk about that later, uh, more detailed. And uh, if you uh, look on this slide, you can see a structure of work permit issues to foreigners in Russia on uh, two last year for available statistic. Uh, uh, now we have a, a few kinds of uh, labor permit for foreigners in the country, uh, but generally for two years, 54% uh, uh, um, uh, was given a, a work permit for foreigners from visa and free visa country. And 46% uh, it was patents for migrants uh, to private sector. And uh, now uh, 10 largest countries which uh, send in to Russia uh, migrants worker are uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, and Kyrgyzstan. There are three countries in the Central Asia region and also China, Ukraine, Moldova, and other countries, including this uh, <coughs> top of sen uh, 10 countries uh, for Russia. And red, uh, um, you can see here uh, two types. Uh, red, uh, green, uh, green color, it's uh, uh, column A, e, uh, uh, work permit. And uh, red color, it's uh, patents for, it's available just for migrants from uh, uh, free visa country. Uh, majority of them, it's a CIS country, former Soviet Union. Uh, that's typical photos I make in um, Tajikistan for um, uh, it's uh, one of leader of uh, sending country for Russia Federation with labor migrants. Uh, 40, uh, around 40 percent of uh, Russian um, of uh, foreigners who works in Russian economy now uh, works in a uh, building, sector of building, building construction. And uh, second position is uh, catering and retail. And uh, as, uh, third position is industry. And as a, uh, on the other place, you can see agriculture, transport and communication sector, and uh, uh, forestry also, wood and industry. And um, this is structure about sectors. And uh, we prepare with my colleague, uh, colleague this map, especially for describe uh, to describe a situation with uh, typical uh, types of um, uh, type of employed for foreigners in Russia. And we we find the uh, five uh, types of regions in the Russia Federation. For f first, for example, uh, where is dominated. Uh, uh, Foreigners worker in uh, works in uh, workers in uh, construction sphere. For example, it's uh, Smolensk, Yaroslav, Rostov, Samara, Krasnodar region. For example, uh, they are dominated on this sector priority. And uh, second type is transport section uh, transport uh, type where foreigners usually work there. And second type in transport and industry combination, two sectors. Next one is uh, retails and service sector. And uh, fifth on fifth place, uh, fifth uh, types, it's uh, agricultural uh, and um, forestry sector. 
let me stop now about uh, talk about three types of uh, work permit in Russia for foreigners. First of all, this is Russian work permit for employers which invited migrants workers from visa regime country. <coughs> it's uh, this special uh, paper for that and uh, this process including two steps. First, it's, uh, you can see previous slide, and on second position, uh, foreigners has a, a special card, special work permit. Uh, it's looking like this, and usually it's available for majority of migrants uh, which accept this work permit uh, are from Vie uh, China, Vietnam, and Turkey. Uh, this photo we made in uh, Mo Moskovska Oblast on some agricultural farm where is working now a lot of Vietnamese migrants, for example, and we have now a research project with Vietnamese colleagues from Vietnamese Academy of Science about process of adapt adaptation and integration Vietnamese people in Russian society and uh, some textile fabric also. And uh, second, second type of uh, work permit is a work permit for foreigners from free visa regime country. A process little bit more easy, and 2010, the uh, Russian government uh, opened a door for foreigners from visa, from visa regime country. And now this process including just one step, it's a little bit easy, but problem is a quota system and um, in civil society in the Russia Federation more critical this process because uh, now around uh, quota system we have a lot of problem with corruption. For example, my last research shows about uh, interesting situation. Uh, if uh, employees ask uh, on next year <coughs> uh, quota for invite to invite uh, some foreigners on uh, 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 on them uh, uh, firms, it's you haven't a guarantee for have this uh, work perm this quota on next year because this quota uh, not concretized to concrete or, uh, employees. And this is main problem of this system. And uh, but usually you can ask a work permit for uh, around now around uh, one thousand U.S. dollar on illegal market, and it's possible on all on during all year. And uh, this is a map show a free visa regime country with Russia. Uh, it's interesting, Russian government and Russian Ministry of External Affairs last time uh, works uh, good of this practice and now many Latin American countries, some countries in Asia and Africa uh, has a free visa regime for Russian citizens and um, also uh, foreigners from the, their, this country has possibility to visit to Russia without visa. but. For a labor market, important nine country uh, for Russia, uh, for Belarusian people has a special condition in Russia. They can possibility to work without visa uh, and without uh, work permit also. Eight other country in the CIS regions uh, citizens from this country can work in Russia without visa. Uh, go to Russia without visa, but for them necessary to ask a special work permit in for uh, for uh, work works in Russian working for uh, in Russian labor market. It's a typical photos where we can see uh, labor migrants from visa from free <coughs> visa regime country. For example, they work working uh, they works uh, on the street in metro, on the uh, market, on the film, and uh, it's typical photo on uh, winter Moscow, 
the cleaning street, a majority of them from Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And the uh, third type of Russian work permit is patent. This system was started just uh, two years ago, in July 2000 and, uh, uh, 2010, uh, and uh, it's more easy for uh, foreigners uh, have, uh, have this uh, type of work permit. And for example, 90% uh, migrants worker who asked uh, this type of uh, permit for uh, labor market, they has this permit. It's, uh, uh, for me, it's a good, um, I, I understand it's system more easy, of course, for Russia, for foreigners. Majority of them from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Armenia. Also, it's very same structure with um, um, uh, with work permit, and um, mm -hmm. uh, it's a type of region. I don't have much time for that. It's our respondents from one research who work in household sector, and. I think it was a revolution, met, revolution measures for Russian migration policy because only one and a half year we can to change status around above one million migrants who were before in illegal labor market. And after these measures, these people, they, they have a possibility to legalization this uh, them status. Uh, on June 13, on uh, this year, President Putin has signed a new concept of state migration policy of the Russia for the period till 2025. And uh, it's uh, this document uh, more more correlated with real demographic situation and migration situation. But how on this document we can see uh, aspect of labor migration? Let me stop on uh, some words about that. It's, uh, I'm sorry, it's a very illustrated map shows dynamic of change Russian population uh, in the Russian regions between last two last census. And uh, for example, you can see situation on the uh, far east, especially, uh, and uh, it's uh, grow up just European and North Caucasian part. But in uh, some Russian regions, we have a very, uh, very big problem with uh, population generally and labor sources <coughs> concretely. And uh, for example, first, first time on Russian official document, we can see a position, some position, some new position, principal new position. First of all, attraction of high scale migrants to Russia. It's very important question. Second position, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but on last data, just 700 high scale migrants we can accept on uh, the Russia Federation. Other position, stimulation, investment, and business immigration in Russia. Other position, stimulation of education immigra immigrants to the Russia Federation. And about, uh, firstly, uh, government talking about integration migrant in the Russian society. And uh, attraction for labor migrants for labor market. But uh, for me, uh, I'm not understanding now uh, this situation with very, very in interesting uh, comparison between two data about how many uh, unemployments in the Russia and how many foreigners migrants we have. It's, uh, we have around five, six million unemployments, and on the same time we have two and a half million of uh, uh, foreigners worker on the labor market. It's paradoxically and need to understand uh, uh, this situation. I haven't time more. <laughs> and uh, some words about maybe future research. 
and um, first of all i uh, i think uh, maybe very perspective research for russian um, uh, russian labor market is and labor migration is how is effective working now in new instrument of regulation of the migration labor migration and how develop infrastructure of management of labor migration because uh, we have new actors of this uh, sector like private sector NGO sector and now federal migration service more open for uh, accepting new idea and uh, maybe maybe it's good possibility for change a situation but uh, necessary result of research okay okay i have other proposed but <laughs> I'm sorry. Kevin time. No, no, it's okay. okay. I, perhaps we can return to this okay. theme thank tomorrow. You. But thank you very, very much for a fabulous presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker, um, it is just a treat to be able to introduce our next speaker. Um, so many of us on this project had had the enjoyable opportunity to spend some time in Ekaterinburg. And we shouldn't use the word hero um, lightly, but I think both Americans and Russians can agree that it's very rare when people on the street talk about how great their local officials are. Um, or at least I can attest, doesn't happen in the <coughs> U.S. very often. In Ekaterinburg, it does happen, primarily because they have an outstanding ombudsman who um, has, has served valiantly Thank you. Um, on a number of social service issues and is extremely well respected among the mig within the migrant community. It's my pleasure to introduce Tatiana Mirozaeva, the ombudsman of the city of Ekaterinburg. <coughs> Можно сесть, да? Migration problems in Russia, uh, experience of regional ombudsman. Migration problems that Russia faces today are typical for the majority of uh, countries which receive migrants. High level of <coughs> illegal migration, uh, non-controlled market of services for migrants, uh, needs of adaptation and um, integration of new citizens. But uh, here in Russia, we have our own uh, future uh, of labor migration. As just several years ago, we used to live uh, in one state with 15 republics, which are now the main sources of labor migrants for Russia. The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Every republic became a country at the post-Soviet uh, territory, adopted its own uh, legislation on the citizenship, uh, principles and rules of the getting the citizenship. But the people's mind has not uh, changed uh, so fast. Um, and as we all used to have Soviet passports and used to go between Soviet republics without any borders. It turned that the first years of my activity <coughs> as ombudsman merged with the period of uh, Tausa legislation on migration. Federal laws on the citizenship on the Russian Federation and the legal uh, status of foreign citizen in the Russian Federation. As, as, a, as a result, I was really overloaded with uh, complaints from people who uh, <coughs> suffered from the obstacles uh, principle prescribed by the new laws. Reality and life uh, circumstances occurred uh, broader and more uh, complicated than those facts which the laws regulated. The new laws set the uh, narrow frames with the not getting into account many issues in reality. I drafted a lot of part, uh, practical uh, proposals to many state uh, borders and institutions, administration of president of Russia, members of uh, council of federations, member of state uh, Duma, federal migration service. As a result of such in 
in, in initiatives from ombudsman and civil society. Uh, some uh, improvement to the legislation were made. New uh, pieces of legislation were adopted. But still, as ombudsman, I regular, uh, regularly get com complaints uh, concerning a different immigrants issue. I can outline the main problem still exists and actual for migrants reality in Russia for several years. The first, legalization of persons without definite legal status. Uh, the second, um, resell resettlement of uh, compatriots. The third, legalization of labor migrants. I um, want to say about uh, uh, resettlement of uh, compatriots. Uh, the amendem amendments uh, to the federal law on state policy in uh, relation to compatriots abroad uh, were adopted in uh, 2010 as a result of many discussions, uh, provisions on the uh, definition of the compatriots have been changed. Not all Soviet citizen can be recognized as compatriots. Special state program for assisting in uh, voluntary uh, resettlement of compatriots to the Russian C Federation was adopted. The problem is that it is not easy to part uh, participate of the program and the people would like to return to their native places, not places which the program uh, definis. <coughs> Svetlovska's name, of, uh, ex name of Ekaterinburg, was always uh, famous for uh, its um, higher educational institution and uh, uh, graduates from institutions and univers universities were sent to work in uh, former Soviet Republic. Today, they and their children return to uh, their native places. Aca according uh, to my practice, uh, comparisons uh, who are not official uh, participants of the program face uh, difficulties with documentation, high customs duties. They also have problems with uh, pensions, uh, permissions to work, medical aid. To get Russian citizenship, these people who are native Russian by origin have to wait alone with the other representat representatives from uh, former Soviet Republic. We support them by vote, but fail to support them by actions. They have no uh, adventures at all in uh, getting uh, permission for uh, temporary residence. Uh, permissions to stay. Uh, they uh, consider this uh, situation as a very unfair one. Moreover, uh, compatriots who are uh, Russian by origin and Russian is their uh, native language are ob obligated uh, now to pass Russian language exam. This policy uh, leads uh, to dissenting Gration and uh, under the Russian-speaking uh, migrants flower. Russia is the uh, successor of uh, Soviet Union on many issues but it. Russia is a historical motherland only for its native people. I think all the former Soviet republics uh, would understand and the uh, amendments to the law uh, granting advantages for uh, compatriots in getting Russian citizenship. They are not migrants, they are uh, repatriates. I hope that uh, the mistake will be uh, corrected and we will change the uh, attitude to this category of people. Legalization of labor migration. Ex Acting of, as the regional ombudsman for several years, I also was a deputy president of an 
interdepartmental uh, commission on um, using foreign labor resources. Many things on this issue have uh, changed in our legislation last year. The vast majority of the problems accrue with migrants from visa-free regime of entry countries. The amount of illegal migrants is raising national uh, st structure of population of Russia in changing. Much money are spent for medical aid to foreigners. Russian language has to be uh, taught in schools as a foreigner one. Uh, fear of illegal service for migrants is uh, developing. It is still hard to find the success successful uh, model of legal regulation of uh, relations between employer and foreigner employer. Pre previously, we have a strict connection between uh, quotas and employer. The uh, permission to work could be uh, granted only through host <coughs> organization. Then we uh, permitted uh, migrants to get job and get the permission to work uh, themselves. Now, uh, the third model is in force. Uh, the permission to work can be uh, obtained by the migrants themselves, but they will be employed only by the employer uh, whose request for quota was approved by the commission. Migrants also may obtain patent granting him right to the employed by uh, the private person. Which model is better? I suppose the first one, which is now not in force. I've heard many different opinions uh, on the issue of quotas as means of controlling migration. Many human rights different, uh, defenders uh, claim to ca cancel quotas as quotas in fact do not influence uh, to this situation with scale and scope of uh, migration. Human rights defenders from ex-Soviet uh, countries can uh, uh, concern about uh, reduction of labor quotas. I do understand this opinion because also quotas are uh, redu uh, reduced migrants uh, nevertheless go to <coughs> Russia uh, but uh, find themselves as uh, illegal persons. Uh, the main task of state administration in the region is uh, securing of interest of local uh, population. This is why we work under uh, morning of um, monitoring of actual needs of, com uh, of companies in em employing uh, foreigners. Assessing the companies requires for quota, the possibility of uh, granting job is uh, considered. It's important because it is not a secret that uh, requests for quotas also are made by companies assisting, assisting migrants to obtain uh, permissions and other documents with no employment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Besides legal services for migrants, there is also black market. Uh, taking the vast majority of illegal labor, uh, labor migrants. It is impossible to control the migrants from while uh, there are actual possibilities for illegal employment of migrants. I am very uh, ca concerned about the fact that illegal labor migrants is more uh, profitable for the employer than the legal one. In such a case, uh, taxes are not paid, uh, salaries are lower. Migrants are afraid they complain about the violations one, uh, of their labor rights as they understand that they are vi uh, violators themselves and can be uh, deported. As Ombudsman, I do my best to help the application uh, in uh, such 
uh, cases. Uh, we draft uh, requests uh, to law uh, enforcement bodies, uh, make uh, law states and appeal against uh, judgments. We cooperate with uh, laws uh, from Human Rights Network, Migration and Law. Foreign citizens in contact uh, to Russian can get uh, very qualified legal and for free, but um, it, it is still difficult to fly with large company. A regional migration center was uh, created in Sverdlovsk uh, region many years ago. I was one of the initi initiators of its uh, creation and uh, made many efforts uh, to persuade the regional many minister to make a discuss. <coughs> uh, the I considered it's necessary for the region uh, to have a state organization uh, disposition, uh, dispos disposing information about actual needs in foreign labor resource and assisting employer and labor migrants to find uh, each other with no uh, infringement uh, to rights of local uh, population. We also have <coughs> the experience of organizing uh, arrangement of foreign labor <coughs> at the civil social level. Two uh, people from uh, NGO uh, Ural House, Leonid Grishin and Rafael Sirajinov, uh, assisted uh, to arrange employment of uh, Kyrgyzstan citizen as medical staff at the North Territories of Sverdlovsk region. The NGO assisted them in adaptation in the region. As regional ombudsman, I deal with a concrete situation, but also trying to analyze the general tendencies uh, and improve the general situation. My annual reports and special reports devoted to uh, concrete problems in particular uh, shares such as person with no status and other are sent to all uh, minis, uh, minis, municipal, regional and federal administration and also are uh, assisted at the website. <coughs> Investigation is under the hugger pressure from the public if the crime is commu uh, committed by the persons of the nation against the person of another nation. The public uh, <coughs> considers uh, that uh, diaspora will help the person to pay money and escape the responsibility. Representatives of another nation afraid that high public uh, this influence <coughs> in investigation card badly and <coughs> it will lead to <coughs> conversation uh, the person whose <coughs> quality is not prone. And the, and the state should <coughs> persuade Russian population of the all nationals by concrete actions that <coughs> the investigation and judicial system are independent, Im <coughs> impartial, and do not experience and pressure of influence. People in Russia should know that the criminal will be uh, convicted and the innocent will be acquired. It could change the public mentality a lot and become a consoli uh, consolidation factor in our society. Спасибо. Я мужественно дочитала. Давно не читала по английски. I want to say <coughs> that I very good say Russian. I very good speak Russian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and я хотела сказать, что большинство из нас был бы просто как рада, если мы умели читать как это на русском. Поэтому ничего. Um, Если вы хоть что-то поняли. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Our next speaker. 
um, are, it will be on a paper by <coughs> Julia Florinskaya, who's well known to many of us, is one of the leading uh, experts on migration in the Russian Federation. She works at the Center for Migration Studies, and her paper will be presented in translation by Professor Aaron Hoffman <coughs> of Utah State University. <coughs> All right. So this presentation is based primarily on the results of two surveys that were done by the Center for Migration Research. Uh, one was a survey of 400 respondents in Moscow and St. Petersburg on possibilities and problems of social integration of labor migrants from Central Asia in Russia. The second survey is a survey of about 1,200 uh, female migrants in Russia, and this was done in Moscow, Moskovskaya Oblast, St. Petersburg, Leningradskaya Oblast, and uh, Krasnodar Krai. Uh, most of the data comes from these two studies, but it's also going to be supplemented with some uh, recently done focus groups and interviews, also done by the Center for Migration Research. So typically, we think of labor migrants as people who come alone, who leaves the, um, they might be single people, they might be married people, but if, they're, if they have families, they leave them behind in the country of origin. And this is indeed a common strategy for migrants in Russia, but it's also not uncommon for families to migrate together. And so this, we're focusing today in this paper on families migrating together. So the Center for Migration Research found that about 60% of migrants in Russia are married, that is either formally married or in some sort of informal uh, marriage type union. Um, and about 40 to 45% of migrants in Russia have children age 16 and under. Um, now of those, some of them leave their families at home and some of them bring them to Russia. So of those migrants who are married, women are much less likely to bring their partners with them to Russia. The CMR found that uh, about 77% of married women are with their husbands in Russia, whereas only 37% of married men have their wives with them in Russia. And this is fairly consistent across national groups. Uh, bringing children, however, is much less common. So about half of respondents have children under eight, uh, 16 and under, as I said. Um, but only about a third of those migrants with children actually have those children with them in Russia. And that accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of all respondents. In general, those uh, migrants who have children with them also have their spouse with them. So in other words, uh, the strategy is whole family migration. Um, it's fairly uncommon, only about 25 percent, um, to have your children with you in Russia but your spouse in the origin country. It's also pretty, com it's, the standard is if you're going to bring your children, you bring all of them. It's actually quite rare for someone with multiple children to have some with them in Russia and some remaining in the home country. So what, uh, what are the factors that influence the decision whether or not to migrate with your children? Um, so these are survey responses from mothers specifically. Um, so so they, uh, they found that women from rural areas are considerably less likely to bring their children than are women who are migrating from urban areas. Level of education is also important, so that women with higher levels of education are more likely to bring their children with them. Uh, country of origin is important, so women, women from Central Asia are much less likely to bring their children than are women coming from the Caucasus. Uh, the material position of the family uh, is important, so women who report that they can just barely make ends meet are less likely to bring their children than are women who are more financially comfortable, but the, actually, the, the differences are actually surprisingly small. Um, all right, and then finally, intended duration of migration. So not surprisingly, permanent people who intend to migrate permanently are more likely to bring their children. But in fact, uh, about 33%, so about a third of um, women intending to migrate permanently still actually don't have their children with them. Among those women who don't have their children with them, uh, more than a third see their children uh, even once a year. 
uh, or it's more than a third don't see their children even once a year. So they see them less than once a year. And not surprisingly, this is a very difficult situation for them. Uh, I have a quote from one of the focus groups from one of the women in the focus groups. Uh, my daughter says, when will you come home? Never did I think that I would see them only once a year. We had always been a family, always had family dinner and breakfast together. Um, the reasons that, uh, we, that migrants don't bring their children with them um, are more or less what you'd expect. The most common reason cited is that they don't want to take their children out of school, so out of their, their local school. 42% uh, of female respondents whose children remained at home said that. Also common was that there was no one to look after them in Russia. Most of these women rely on extended kin networks in their home countries to take care of their children. They don't have those networks in Russia. Uh, only 12% said that it was too expensive to bring children. Um, another 2% said that the children didn't want to live in Russia. Um, and small numbers gave other answers. Um, in general, research shows that children of migrants integrate more easily than their parents do into Russian society. And a big part of this is played by the educational system. Um, particularly important is preschool or kindergarten, or for those of you who speak Russian, детский сад. Um, so in other words, a, a daycare, early childhood education that's provided for children who aren't old enough for elementary school. Um, so the study found that one out of every four migrant children of preschool age attended a preschool, compared to between 50 and 80 percent of native Russian children. Um, there are a number of barriers that make both financial and informational barriers that make getting your children into preschool somewhat difficult for migrants. Um, migrants from our Azerbaijan, about 43% of children attended preschool. From Armenia, about 64%. Among migrants from Central Asia, however, it's only 10%. The informational and financial barriers seem to be larger in that group. In general, it's much easier to get a child into uh, public school than it is to get them into preschool. So um, one, another quote from the focus group. There we go. Um, when registering for the first grade, we missed the submission deadline. We didn't know that it was April 1st, and so by the time we began the process in June, all the seats in the class were taken. Instead, we were given the address of a school a little further away. There we were able to register without any problems. Um, so even when you do have these informational barriers, migrant parents are usually able to um, get their children into elementary school, or to public school. So about 79% of mothers who came with their school-age children were able to enroll those children in local schools. On the other hand, there are barriers, and the big barrier that they found is the need to buy a medical insurance policy for your child. Without a medical insurance policy, you can't get the vaccinations that schools require to enroll children. Um, Russian language is another barrier, especially as more migrants are coming from rural areas and are less likely to have been educated in Russian than migrants from urban areas. So one out of 10 mothers, all of whom came from Central Asia, reported that their children did not attend school in Russia. Uh, finally, on to health care. Uh, typically, children of migrants have actually had better access to health care than their parents do. Um, as this chart shows, um, and I'm sorry, I wasn't able to translate the Russian in the chart, uh, but what this shows is that um, only 13% in this dark purple, only 13% of, chil of children never attended medical clinics. Uh, about 55% attended medical, uh, got medical care, and then their parents just paid every time that they used the clinic. Um, others had access to free clinics or had an insurance policy. Um, one area of concern, however, is out in, on January 1st, 2012, a new policy went into effect, and I won't uh, go into any detail since I'm not actually the expert on this, uh, but what happens is that children are no longer able to get regular, consistent access to medical care, so that they're not seeing the same doctor. They don't it, vaccination schedules. The parents are totally responsible for figuring out what vaccine their child needs when, which is of course very difficult for many of the parents. Um, so the conclusion that I want to give from this whole that I got out of this paper is that. 
family migration to Russia is still somewhat rare. It's not the most common strategy, but there is a large population of family migrants, and it's an important population because these children of migrants, um, they can, they could become uh, an important resource for Russian society. They they could be become integrated, become. Uh, you know, help deal with this declining working age population in Russia. Um, but unfortunately, recent Russian policies on education and healthcare uh, have made it more difficult for the children of immigrants to integrate. Um, and that's going to be a challenge in the future. Thank you, Erin. And right on time. And Yulia, after her. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Well done, Yul <coughs> Maledyat, Yulia. <laughs> okay. Our final speaker before we open it up for question um, is a longtime friend of both the Kennan Institute, and um, I'm pleased to say myself personally. I'm very, very pleased to introduce Tatyana Bagdasarovna, who is from now the Russian International Affairs Council. Um, and had previously or is still associated with the um, New Eurasia Foundation in Moscow. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's it's real pleasure and honor to be here to participate in this famous conference. And thank you for invitation, the Wilson Institute. Um, I represent here in this conference, I represent the Russian Council on Foreign Affairs. Mm. My presentation is in two parts. First, I would like to talk about the Council, which launched on the project by John Up and subsequent publication, Migration Anthology. Then I will tell why the Council decided to publish Migration Anthology and how we are working on making this anthology. Russian International Affairs uh, Council was established upon the decision of the co-founders and in compliance with the instruction of the president of Russian Federation on of February 2nd 2010 so it's it's a young organization the council goal is to facilitate a wide-ranging public and expert dialogue around the issues of foreign policy and international affairs Towards the aim, the Council promotes constructive cooperation between the state, authorities, policy think tank, civil association, and business. Russian Foreign Minister Mr. Lavrov repeatedly stressed that foreign policy is no longer a prerogative of only the foreign ministers. Academy of Science, NGOs, and the representative of business are involved in its preparation and implementation. That is why he said, the launch of the Russian Foreign Affairs Council complies with modern international trends and common practices. Russian International Affairs Council is a non-profit membership organization. It includes founders, uh, individual members, uh, corporate members, and partners. There are five co-founders of Council, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Education, Russian Academy of Science, Interfax, and Russian Union of Industrials and Entrepreneurs. The Council is, represents a link between uh, the state, expert community, business, and civil uh, society is an effort uh, to find uh, foreign policy solutions. Uh, there are uh, 107 individuals, members of the council. All of them are well-known people in Russia. They are directors of institutions of, of Academy of Science, heads of state human federation committees, ambassadors of Russia and directors of, and the head of departments of the biggest Russian universities, chairmen of boards and directors of the Russian holdings and business corporations, as well as deputy ministers and ministers of the Russian government. List of corporate members you, you can see here includes nine famous Russian companies. They are both state companies and private companies. I, I, to, to have time, I will note to, to, to tell about uh, each company you, you can see 
this. There are five state universities, uh, which also corporate member of the council. <coughs> Among them, there are two Moscow universities, Mgimo, a uh, very important uh, university uh, dealing with international relations, and Russian State University for hum Humanities, and three federal universities in the Northwestern Russian, Immanuel Kant Baltic Federal University, in Northern Russia, Northern Arctic Federal University, and Ural Federal University. The list of universities is not completed at the moment. Five universities from the regions applied for membership in the council. Uh, council partners are well-known Russian government and non-government organization, policy think tanks, foundation agency. Also, you can see uh, uh, them here. Uh, they are, pri they, they are uh, for, uh, among them National Training Foundation, Russian Geographic so society, which is the oldest scientific organization in Russia that has been united sciences since 1845. <laughs> or, for example, Institute of Comp Contemporary Development uh, is a Russian policy think tank that develops practical recommendations for the president and government of the Russian Federation, as well as analytical information and materials for the public. I'm sorry. How to? So next, next slide. Uh, Russian uh, International Affairs Council activities are aimed at strengthening peace, friendship, and solidarity between people, preventing international conflicts, and promoting crisis settlement. There are four main activities you can see here. Research work and international expertise activities aimed at providing analysis and forecast of global risks and opportunities for benefit of Russian diplomacy, businesses, educational centers, public organizations, and their foreign peers. Training and educational activities include uh, holding conferences, seminars, round tables, winter and summer schools, which get together young faculty and graduate students from all regions of Russia. Communication and public activities. I would like to stress that Council operates as an open and independent discussion forum and provide broad opportunities for communication between Russian political establishment and civil society in the whole range of international relations and foreign policy issues. And international activities tries to create favorable conditions for Russia's fastest integration into the global world by implementing multilateral network projects and initiatives, information support for Russian foreign policy and public diplomacy initiatives. This is an example of communication activities. This is a page of Council Internet po Portal to assist communication activities. Portals published in Russian and in English. Attendance of the portal is about 1,500 unique visitors per day and 4,000 readers uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, receive subscribe. Sub, subscribe. Mm. Uh, now I would like to, uh, to tell a little bit about uh, uh, migration anthology. Three volume migration anthology is continuation of the work of the Russian International Affairs Council aimed at the preliminary results of the process of entering Russia in the globalized world in the beginning of the century. The first fundamental work on this global issues was a six volume Russian in Global War 2000-2011 that was published in early this year. Uh, this book has already become a rarity being used by a wide and other voice aud audience, students, educators, journalists, researchers, a representative of non-profit non organizations and businesses. A migration anthology is decided to one particular manifestation of globalization, namely international migration processes. This affects Russia as well. Uh, choosing thematic priority priorities, we proceed from the fact that international migration today is one of the major challenges facing humanity. In many countries, migrants make up a significant part of the population, and their part continues to grow rapidly. 
According to the expert's opinion, during the decade, the count of, the, of residents may be changed upon to 1 billion people. Uh, this picture was made in the Russian International Affairs Council <coughs> during, uh, office during expert meeting in August this, uh, this year, which was opened by Andrei Kartanov, the council chief executive, Jan Zanchkovsky and, and Nikita Mkrchan um, are the supervisors of the migration ontology who have developed the context of it and invited to work on the ontology as a leading Russian experts involved in various aspects of migration. Uh, Three volume migration anthology is the first in the Russian science attempt to cover all the basic dimensions of migration processes in Russia. It includes the evolution of expert community opinions, the dynamics of the main schools in the migration field, and formation of the legal framework governing the migration policy at different levels. Social and political debate on migration issue so far has not been completed. That fact generated a lot of difficulty for us. On the one hand, we did not want to give uh, uh, preference to any one position before dismissing the arguments of its opponents. On the other hand, we do not consider it possible to include in, in the ontology journalist texts bearing seal on the political situation or political party opinions. After a long debate, it was decided to evaluate the proposed materials only in terms of their professional level, regardless of political preference or institution affiliation of the author. We try to get together texts from the leading experts in the field of migration, uh, the basic tendencies of migration in historical perspectives, as well as modern state migration in Russia, to fill the gap oh, oh, in the analytical legal information literature to topic of migration in Russia and the former uh, Soviet Union countries. Anthology includes 34 thematic sections on various aspects of migration. Each section begins with introductory article written by well-known Russian experts in the migration field. We managed to get together all Russian famous experts dealing uh, with different issues of migration process. There are uh, from five to eight expert articles in each thematic section. There are three volumes. First volume uh, is devoted to migration process in relevant uh, migration issues. It covers 28 thematic sections. The second volume is devoted to migration policy and legislation. Uh, it includes six thematic sections. And separate volume is devoted to useful annot annotation bibliography on migration. Uh, here you can see a uh, 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 you can see um, organizations, a list of organizations who might be interested in our an anthology. When we try to work on this uh, uh, anthology, we start thinking who it might be interesting. It turned out that a lot of organizations may be interested in. You see non-government organizations, how education institute, library of regional university, academic institutes for teachers and students, and Department of International Relations, anthology make up the shortfall in quality of literature of migration in regional universities. Co and no co media because uh, uh, it will contribute to the objective mapping of migration process in Russia, preventing appearance of stereotypes of migrants coming to Russia. Committee of State Duma and Federal Council uh, and specific target at, uh, audience make employees association and private employment agency. Anthology can be useful source of information for analysts of, of companies agency who employs migrants. Uh, um, uh, anthology may act as desktop for committees of state Duma and federal council. Uh, <coughs> And special target audience can also serve international organizations dealing with migration. Uh, hardly, uh, hardly anyone uh, would deny that neither uh, Russian so so society nor the state was ready for migration explosion, which occurred after 1991. 
The search for an inadequate response to the migration challenge of post-Soviet Russia could not have been easy and faster. The materials collected in the anthology show that during the second decade of its existence, the new Russia has continued this search. Experts, politicians, and journalists continue to agree not only about the specific mechanism of migration management, but about a particular or about a particular bill, but on the fundamental principles of basic approaches to development of national migration strategy. Here you see the portrait of Yelena Tirukano, who was the leader, uh, initiator, and inspire folk of on the anthology. Uh, she has developed a uh, first draft of anthology content. She has developed a methodology for the, the selection articles to include in, anto in anthology. She also has developed guidelines for writing an introductory articles, which were then very useful to communicate with introductory articles authors. She managed to develop it only four thematic sections on anthology and write an, an introductory article for one of them. Uh, she was director of the Center of Migration. Uh, she works with government and uh, as, uh, as expert in development of bills that were that were uh, prepared the State Duma and Federation Council. She has uh, made a great contribution to the study of labor migration to Russia. We ask the leadership of the Russian International Affairs Council and receive a permission to dedicate the migration anthology memory of Ilyana Tirukanova, who died in April this year. Mm, this is a Uh, this is the last uh, uh, slide of my presentation. In parallel with migration anthology, the Russian Foreign Affairs Council held a work on, uh, on the handbook Migration Field in Russia. The title is Migration Field in Russia, uh, a directory of organization. The handbook will become an organic supplement anthology, easy to anyone to find partners, colleagues, and associates interested in the problems of migration in Russia or through practical work in this field. The handbook is decided to collect and systemize information organization dealing with various aspects of migration process in Russia by classification of existing organi organization by formal and meaningful characteristics. Uh, such as date of establishment, number of people working in the organization, number of projects, regional affiliation, amount of, uh, or amount of finance. The handbook includes organizations that provide assistance to migrants, NGOs involved in, in, in information and practical activities, NGOs in, engaged in information work, non-profit organizations with elements of commerce and business organizations, government organizations, organizations working in the field of culture, and their cultural uh, migrants as well as international organization in world uh, two, se two sentences I have thank you mm, uh, there are two uh, 250 researchers and practitioners dealing with migration all over Russia are included in the sector of personalities of the handbook in conclusion, I would like to note that by publishing Migration Anthology and Migration Handbook, the Russian Foreign Affairs Council does not complete its work in this area. This trend will be continued, and the Council invites all interested organizations to cooperate in this complex but very important for our state and society field. Thank you for your attention and time. That's all I would like to talk, to Thank tell. You. Thank you. I'm going to give a mini discussion here on just five <coughs> points that draw these papers together. And the first one that, that really draws all, all of the presentations is this idea of Kamu Abrashitsa. Where do you go for help? What can migrants do? Indeed, Sergei um, seems to point out that they can go to the black market if they really want a quota, um, Spravka, if they really need um, those legis um, legislative uh, provisions. In some places, like Ekaterinburg, they can go to the ombudsman's office and find assistance and find help. In Yulia Florenskaya's paper, they can interact with schools, with principals who may be helpful, may not be, with medical facilities that may be helpful and also may not be. Um, and it's wonderful that indeed you're working on this 
directory of organizations that, again, can provide that information for migrants on where they can go for assistance and for information. Another theme that pulls all these together is the idea of the idea that migrants are diverse and changing. Um, they are diverse in terms of the law by their res place of origin, as um, Professor Rizansev points out in his ar article. They are diverse in terms of including both labor migrants and a sizable community of repatriates that pr propose different challenges to the Russian migration uh, policy sphere. And they di are differentiated by the group in which they migrate. Are they migrating as individuals or as families? If indeed we take Sergei's point about the rising quota for household servants as, as a trend, we're likely to see an increase in gender, uh, in women's migration. So the gender balance will start to shift. When it does start to shift, according to Yulia's uh, research, we are more likely to see more families coming in, which will indeed assure us that the ombuds people in all of the regional offices will remain very, very busy for, for some time to come. Okay. Lastly, very quickly, I also want to highlight the idea of education as being a, a important theme. Education, especially higher education, is inextricably linked with migration, but we also see by Yulia Florinskaya's paper that even primary education plays a major role in how migrants navigate this very tr challenging landscape. Two recommendations, and this fits in with Tatiana's presentation as well, is the fact that education has always played a major role in migrant assimilation, whether one looks at Western Europe in the experience of the British Empire or most specifically in the United States, and that more comparative assessments of how education is working, what are the challenges and what are the possibilities, would be extraordinarily helpful. The anthology of, of migration literature from Russia can be of great service to all of us, and I would just simply pose as a challenge that what we need to do is take that work, think about how it reflects or challenges the experiences from other countries, and think about very critically exposing all of our work to that sort of critical comparative review that Ellen so eloquently spoke of in her opening remarks. That's it. We have some time for questions, and given that we had very little time um, for the first session, um, I'll even open it up if you want to ask a question from the first session. Um, our speakers are still here. So um, does anyone have a question for this panel or the previous panel? Please. Hi. I'm Marilis Lugo, the favorites, Howard University. Um, I guess I'll start with the coming about the first panel. Because um, I just think I'm the only Puerto Rican in Slavic studies, and I have to shout out to the comments about Telemundo Land because I grew up there. But I also wanted to point out that there's one commonality that was not mentioned, which is in the Soviet, post Soviet case and in Latin American case, you have issues of borders that move and families that don't. Particularly looking at Southwest uh, migration. Part of the thing that you have is that you have families that historically have been there for generations. So you have people who go, and my parents actually now live next to Bertham Boy, where about a third of their town moved in the 1960s. So there's the whole point of the borders that move families that don't, and how that starts making bridges and complicates the whole migration thing. So that's one common point where we could definitely make somebody who's a walking paradox like me feel even more at home in the field. No. Вам всем спасибо за ваши доклады. Они очень интересные. А у меня маленькие вопросы. А Юли Фаринской, а сти я живу здесь, Мериленди, в нашем районе огромное количество новых иммигрантов в Латинской Америке, и там есть то, что мы называем ребёнок переводчик. То есть ребёнок ходит в школу, а он специалист по местному городу. Он работает переводчиком. И тут я жила, очевидно. А, но заметили ли вы а, такой ну, ребенок переводчик в, сем в семьях, которые вы а, изучали? А, Do you want to give the translation? Sure. Um, I just asked uh, Ms. Mladinskaya sure. um, if she noticed the complex of the child translator that we have here in the Maryland region. I live in a region that's had a huge influx of Latin American immigrants. And that's one of the biggest problems, that it's the child who is responsible for translating for the parents. 
А, Татьяна Мерзли... Мерзликович, а, спасибо за ваш доклад. А какая самая большая разница между а, ну, как государство относится к эмигрантам бывшего союза, потому что, очевидно, это был бывший союз. Так что вы как омбудсмен, а, как это влияет над вашей работой, а к Сергею Рязанцеву, могли ли вы объяснить разницу между нормальной визой и патентом, потому что это как-то не было совершенно не ясно. So, Сергей Рязанцев, he could just clarify a little bit the difference between the regular visa and the patent, because I kind of got confused at the beginning, because I'm thinking patent, scientific discovery, it doesn't immediately go to that. And to Ms. Mersiakova, if she could talk about the fa how the fact that a lot of immigrants are from the former Soviet Union, how that affects her work, because again, borders move, people don't. И что касается детей переводчиков, это действительно явление, которое появилось недавно, потому что проблема незнания детьми русского языка приезжими, она сильно раз, ну, преувеличена, скажем так, пока с массовым незнанием мы еще не сталкивались. Вот сейчас начали появляться случаи, когда приезжают семьи, где плохо говорят по-русски, и дети первыми начинают говорить. И более того, родителям иногда нам на фокус-группах говорили, трудно общаться с детьми, потому что дети предпочитают говорить по-русски. Вот это явление появилось, оно не массово, но тем не менее, даже как стратегию интеграции предлагали родителей интегрировать через детей, обучающихся в школах, так или иначе, какие-то собрания в школе делать, встречи, вечера для родителей, вот в таком плане. То есть мы это явление увидели, но оно пока не массовое. So this is, uh, so quickly, um, there's a, this is a pretty new phenomenon, this idea of children translators in Russia, because it's fairly new to have large-scale migration of whole families that don't speak Russian, but it is starting to occur that uh, children, or that parents are relying on their children to translate for them. And you're see similarly, on the focus groups, they found that some parents find it hard to relate to their children because the children prefer to speak Russian and the parents don't necessarily speak it very well. Um, but they find it hopeful that the s schools are a, a vehicle of integration not just for the children but for the whole family. Как государство относится к мигрантам, бывшим из Советского Союза приехавшим, я бы сказала по-разному. Умные люди понимают, что это неизбежность миграции, неизбежность по многим позициям, в первую очередь, потому что сами эти страны сегодня не могут обеспечить работой людей. И умные руководители, а я работала с таким губернатором, понимают очень хорошо, что для нас это, мы говорим, российский крест, нести его на себе. Даже когда в период кризиса не было достаточно рабочих мест для своих людей, рабочих, мы все равно принимали иммигрантов. Что касается того, что по-разному, да, очень много популизма идет от профсоюзов. Очень много. И я как практик это чувствую. Это влияет и на вот молодых начинающих губернаторов. О том, что надо сохранить свои рабочие места, надо остановить приток иностранных рабочих. Об этом говорят. И некоторые молодые неуравновешенные политики, они поддаются этому обаянию наших профсоюзов, которые вместо того, чтобы защищать своих людей, вот занимаются значит, вот такими лозунгами. И поэтому начинается урезание квот и все остальное. Единственное, что я бы хотела сказать, это то, что в последние годы мы очень хорошо начали понимать, что существует все-таки отличие соотечественников, отличие постсоветских мигрантов от просто мигрантов со всего мира. Okay, um, so there's variation in responses. Um, so the sort of uh, intelligent bureaucrats and governors uh, tend to see that migration is is just a fact. It's something that Russia has to deal with uh, and accept it as sort of 
Russia's burden to take in former Soviet um, migrants. Um, so they're more interested in coming up with intelligent policies for dealing with it. Um, among some of, especially younger governors and coming from the uh, professional, from workers' unions, um, there's a lot of self-interest. You know, they're, they're worried about immigrants taking jobs away from, from their own people. Um, and in recent years, there's been an increasing distinction between migrants from the former Soviet Union, compatriot migrants, eth ethnic Russians, and migrants from the rest of the world. And so uh, a lot of people see compatriots and former Soviet migrants as sort of Russia's special responsibility. A short information about difference, uh, different between uh, two documents. Um, a work permit is document for migrants who works in uh, company and firms and uh, in Russian languages, juridical lizo, juridical uh, organization. And patent is document for migrants who works only in private sector, special on for person on house, on householder. It's uh, like uh, <coughs> physical, it's, uh, it's different. Between juridical status of employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so short. Okay, one more. It will be short. <laughs> My name is Susie Crate from George Mason and I, um, I want to ask a question to um, Jesse and Beth from the first panel. It just jumped out at me because we're talking about such, you know, change. We're talking about change and transformation and movement of peoples. And then you had this question about traditional life. And it just jumped out at me as really wondering how did you actually ask that question and did you go any deeper? Did you go into some kind of a description of what you meant by that? And then, you know, of course, then I thought, well, what does it mean to the people who were asked? Do, are they thinking of pre-Soviet Georgian life or is traditional Soviet, you know, here. Um, thank you for the question. And it's really important whenever anyone does any kind of survey analysis to think very carefully about the way that you're phrasing because that's going to influence your response. Um, in this case, we use somebody else's survey and so I can't, I can tell you how they phrased it, but I can't explain really why. It was phrased in Georgian as a traditional way of Georgian life. So they were trying to get at changes to Georgian culture with the way that they asked the question. Georgian. Yeah, right. I, I think we ought to discuss this more in, during lunch and during and the after. lunch break. And it's a, it's a wonderful question. And again, it's good that we opened it up for that first panel. There were there was not a lot of time for questions, but I'd like to thank all of our presenters for a wonderful panel. Thank you very very much for your enlightening presentations. Thank you. We will now take a hour break for lunch, well, a little less, 55 minute break for lunch. Conference participants, um, would you please take your pink tickets and go down to the boardroom, down the hall for lunch. And we invite everyone else to be our guest back here in one hour. We'll start very promptly at two o'clock in order to stay on schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you.